Throughout history, cities all over the world have lost parts of themselves to war, plague, economic decline and fire. And Glasgow, more than any other Scottish city, has lost so much of its architectural heritage. This graph shows that between 1961 and 1975, Glasgow accounted for more than half of the statutory demolitions in Scottish cities. But that's only part of the story. Why then have we lost so much Glasgow? The raids go on. Glasgow is the latest city to come under the fire of Nazi bombers by night. Once again, we see the trail of destruction that follows the path of this war, started by Hitler in his ambition to rule the world. It was the first big attack on this great city of Scotland. If you were to ask someone in the street, they'd probably tell you it was because of World War II and the Blitz. But the German bombers only destroyed so much of the built environment, even though they took so many lives. But in 1943, Glasgow lost one of its most unique buildings. Alexander Greek Thompson was one of Glasgow's most famous architects, and you can see his influence as much in the commercial architecture in New York City as you can still see in Glasgow today. In 1943, Nazi bombers destroyed his Queen's Park Church, which stood not far from where I stand right now. It's one of the examples of great Glaswegian architecture destroyed by foreign forces, but the rest of the vandalism was done by Glaswegians. To understand Glasgow's architectural history, we have to go much further back than that. The city's name comes from an old Britonic word. That's Old Welsh to you and me. And the best guess that we have is that it means dear green place. And that deer might have meant holy, because it was just over there that St Mungo, according to legend, founded this church and the medieval settlement of Glasgow grew. We medieval Glasgow was centred around the Trongate and the Mercat Cross that still stands today. That was the old town centre and the market of Glasgow. And Glasgow formed a double cruciform shape that came up to here in the cathedral. I wish I could show you more of it, but almost none of it remains. If you look behind me, you'll see the Royal Infirmary. But if we went back hundreds of years, we wouldn't see an infirmary. We would see a castle, the Bishop's Castle. That's right, aye, Glasgow used to have a castle. Nobody knows exactly when the castle was built, but it makes its first appearance on record in the mid-1200s. In the 1300s, it was held by the English and recaptured by William Wallace during the Wars of Independence. And it was a character in the story of Mary Queen of Scots as she battled her enemies, and it was even briefly occupied by French troops. The Royal Infirmary is one of Glasgow's best examples of Victorian architecture. But if you've ever been to an old city anywhere in Europe, or even just Edinburgh, you'll understand a little bit of what we're missing. In 1792, the castle had fallen into a state of disrepair and was demolished to make way for the Royal Infirmary. And then in 1915, that Royal Infirmary was demolished to make way for this one. It was probably one of the first examples of the city's leaders having no respect for the ancient architecture of Glasgow. What might this city feel like today if we still had our castle? Glasgow was growing into an increasingly prosperous port in Royal Borough. This was largely due to its connections to slavery in the American South and the Caribbean, especially after the Act of Union. The Glasgow of the mid-1800s had Edwardian, Palladian, medieval architecture and everything in between, but the Industrial Revolution was starting, and the Victorians were about to build almost all of the Glasgow that we know today. But they also destroyed almost everything that stood before. It was they, perhaps more than anyone else, that started the vandalism. There's this place, Rotten Row, which is now basically part of Strathclyde University. It used to be the site of dense medieval tenements and the old pedagogy, the first site of Glasgow University. You may think that it was called Rotten Row for some nasty reasons, but some think it comes from the Gaelic for Road of Kings. In 1860, it was all swallowed up by the infamous Lock Hospital for Dangerous Women with Sexually Transmitted Diseases. The Duke's Lodgings was one of the oldest and grandest noble houses in Glasgow. It was demolished to make way for Duke Street Prison, which also swallowed up the old dry gate, which once had houses and tenements with thatched roofs and timber. And in time, Victorian Glasgow swept away the thatched cottages of the Belle of the Bray, 
where William Wallace had won his victory and retook Glasgow's castle. So by the time that Queen Victoria died and her age ended, Glasgow had lost almost all of its medieval architecture. And it was now one of the biggest cities in Europe, and it would soon be one of the first to pass a million people. In the process, Glasgow built some of the finest Victorian and early 20th century architecture anywhere in the world. That age built stuff like the Kelvin Grove Museum, the City Chambers, Homewood House, the Mitchell Library, the People's Palace, Glasgow's great commercial architecture, and most of its tenements. But Glasgow had one more flourish to offer the world. It was here that people like Charles René Mackintosh and Margaret MacDonald influenced the Art Nouveau movement and gave birth to the Glasgow style. They alone gave us the Willow Tea Rooms, Scotland Street School, House for an Art Lover, and of course, the Glasgow School of Art, which still lies charred in ruins after fire in 2014 and 2018. the Second World War, Glasgow was an industrial and architectural marvel, but the Luftwaffe's bombers marked the beginning of Glasgow's long period of destruction and decline. They focused on the industry of Clyde Bank, taking most of its housing, but Clyde Bank is no longer technically part of Glasgow, and they left much of the city unscathed. We must kill the street. We shall truly enter into modern town planning only after we have accepted this preliminary determination. That's what this man, Le Corbusier, said. He was the father of modernist architecture and planning, a way of thinking that Glasgow's planners and local government were only too happy to be swept up by. After all, it was the fashion of the time. Modernist thinking told us that the city of the future was one where cars reigned supreme, where brutalist high-rise towers would stretch skywards separated by acres and acres of green space, where density and close human connection was to be despised and destroyed. The modernists were either so revolutionary or so arrogant that they thought they knew better than the thousands of years of human experience that came before them, and their movement and ways of thinking still wreak havoc upon cities across the world today. See this building, it didn't matter whether it rained or the sun shone, you know, or what, this building still looked desolate. It still looked dark, grey, dull and depressing. Somebody said at one time as well that it was supposed to have been designed like a ship. You know what I mean? Well, I would actually take out the pee and put in the tea, you know what I mean? If it was up to me, man, you know what I mean? Design of these buildings are terrible. Totally terrible. But then again, you know, it was, they were designed in the 60s. People were full of ideas, you know what I mean? <laughs> When we think of Glasgow in the early and mid 20th century, we tend to think of poverty, overcrowding and even disease. The city fathers and governments of the post-war period saw answers in modernist thinking. I have no doubt that the people who made the decisions to move people out of Glasgow and carve up the city had good intentions. But the thinking of the time saw urbanism as the enemy. In 1950, Glasgow was one of the densest cities in the world, with a population of over a million people. But by 2001, Glasgow's population had dwindled to 579,000. It's a story that cities all over the world would recognise. Cities like Birmingham, and especially many American cities like Detroit. People smarter than me have tried to explain and describe Glasgow's economic and population decline. And the problems facing Glasgow and its people in the post-war period were huge. But I'm just not convinced that moving people out to new towns and into high-rises while destroying entire neighbourhoods was ever in the city's interests. If we ignored the thinking of the time, could we have solved the overcrowding by just building more tenements? Was it the way Glasgow was built that was the problem? Or was it the failure of the society of the time to look after people? Whatever that answer is, I can't help but think that we gutted Glasgow of all of its urban bulk and density because of some trendy and ultimately damned way of thinking. In 1962, Jane Jacobs wrote The Death and Life of Great American Cities and since then, so many of our policy conversations around urban planning have followed her words. She realised that the orthodoxy of the time was mad, and she hated everything that Le Corbusier and the modernist planners stood for. And despite the modernist influence that still persists, people are finally catching up with her thinking. <laughs>
we're now talking about things like 15 minute cities and embracing density. Jane Jacobs saved so much in New York from being demolished. If Glasgow had someone like her, what might the Gorbals, Townhead or Anderson look like? But around then Glasgow was falling for American style motorway schemes and ideas of urban planning that are already out of fashion. Glasgow was about to make its biggest mistake. By 1972, the M8 and the Kingston Bridge was ploughed right through the middle of Glasgow, destroying communities in Anderston, Kingston and much of the south side. And to this day, Glasgow struggles to repair the gaping holes in development around the motorway. The period since World War II has just been destruction on top of destruction. Perhaps the biggest crime was the demolition of the St Enoch station and hotel because it's so easy to imagine how that beautiful building could have been repurposed into an event space or how it could have hosted so many different cafes, restaurants and businesses. And to think that that landmark and all the surrounding buildings were demolished to make way for a glass shopping centre. Not everything can be explained by modernist planning, motorways or shopping centres. But since World War II, we've lost buildings like the Christian Institute, the Royalty Theatre, the Regent Theatre, the Alhambra Theatre, Brentfield Street United Presbyterian Church, Copeland and Lye department store and really we're just scratching the surface of everything that Glasgow's lost. But not everything that we've lost since then was some Victorian wonder. We've also tore down tower blocks, the Red Road Flats, the Gallagher Twins and Hutchison Town Sea and whatever we might think of them, people still live there and some must have loved them. Scotland's biggest city and its folk have been through a lot, and there's so much more to say, but whether it was because of the industrial revolution, war, economic decline, or just terrible planning decisions, we've lost so much of Glasgow, and we let much of it go way too easily. But there's still so much of Glasgow to love and to protect, and maybe that we take for granted. So next time you're in the city, remember to look up. I think that's enough beetle.